Good morning. It's good to be here with you together, our church family, and it's my opportunity, blessing for me to be able to share with you, big responsibility, and, uh, but that is one thing that God wants me to do, and I trust you pray. I know you do. Thank you for letting me know. It's an encouragement. Uh, John, in the Gospel of John, is written by a man who knew Jesus personally. He had walked with Jesus. He lived with him for several years. And uh, this is what he said uh, about that experience. He said, the word was, the word being Jesus, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, God made himself into flesh, into a human being and lived among us. And we beheld his glory. We could see him. We saw his glory. We beheld it. And the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full. So what was full of grace and truth? And I wonder sometimes, we like to think, what was it like to know Jesus in that way? We all probably say that while we know Jesus, um, none of us knows Jesus in the same way that John did. So John, uh, the apostle, he knew Jesus. He, wa- he lived with Jesus. And when he talked about Jesus, he says, we beheld his glory as only the glory of one, the only begotten of the Father, and then it says, full of grace and truth. And so that is a phrase that has caught my attention uh, some time ago. I, I love it. I think it, as far as my experience with Jesus, it's, it's, a, perfect, it's a perfect statement. And so we want to, this morning, um, we know that uh, you know, we, we want to meet God, we like to be with God, we talk about living with God, for God, um, the people know God, and so uh, we want to look at uh, what does the Bible say? How, what does it look like to meet God? What is an encounter with God like? We like, like I said, we, we, we're people nowadays, and us included, we like to know God. We like to say, well, we are one that have been with God. And so what is it like? And so we want to look at the Bible. We want to look at numerous examples uh, and some of you have heard this message before, but we want to look at numerous examples of people in the Bible that met God in a very real way, in a very spectacular way. And when I started thinking about this, I realized there are more than I thought. And so that's what we want to look at. How does the Bible describe a very real encounter with God? That's what we want to look at this morning. So you'll need your Bibles if you want to follow along. We'll be doing be heavy on Bible reading this morning again, and that's good. I like that. And so if you'll, we'll start in Genesis chapter 2. That's the first encounter. And I may have missed some. I probably don't cover all of them, but we'll look at as many as time allows this morning. <clears throat> and whether this is necessarily the very first encounter of, between God and man, uh, I'm not sure, but it is one of the first And it is very interesting, a very beautiful, very uh, innocent type of encounter. It doesn't even seem that serious the way when you and I think about meeting God, it seems pretty serious, uh, maybe different than this. So if you're in Genesis chapter 2, we'll read, uh, start in verse 18. This is where God had made Adam. And so God gave Adam the opportunity to name the animals. And that's where God is interacting with man, almost Well, let's read it. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. That doesn't seem to fit together, but uh, he formed every beast of the field from the ground, it says, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And that's a phrase that I just kind of liked. So here's God, the big creator God. He's making the animals. He's making horses. He's making elephants. He's making snakes. He's making birds and eagles and songbirds and mosquitoes and, and all uh, honeybees. And he's making alligators and all this stuff. He's animals, he, creatures he's making. And then he's bringing to, the, to Adam. I just re- like the way it says. It says to see what he would call them. It's kind of like a parent with a child, right? He's doing something and say, well... Let's see what he'll do, right? Kind of, I don't know if it is really that way, but it almost sounds that way. Right? God brought him to him and says, to see what he will call them. And so that, just to me, you know, as we think about the mighty creator God interacting with his creation 
in purity, in innocence, that's what it was. And it's good, it's beautiful, it's what it says. And to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So God was fine with that. God brought the animal to him, and Adam made a sound, and God said, okay, that's the name, right? So God was fine with that. And it's almost hum humorous, uh, we can take it that way, but... God, it isn't really. God interacting with his creation, just in purity and, and beauty and innocence, and it was good and it was lovely, and whatsoever Adam called every living thing, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And so we'll not go into that any further. God interacting with mankind. God interacting with people. And then we'll flip the page over to Genesis chapter 3, and uh, we'll uh, read verse 8. So this is after Adam and Eve had interacted with the devil. So the devil had come to them and said, well, if you would eat this fruit, then life would be better. If you would do this, what God said you shouldn't do, then life would be better. So that's maybe a, a thought that is familiar to us. Most of us, or all of us that are adults, we have encountered that. If you would do this wrong thing, then your life would be better from there on. And that's what Adam and Eve experienced too, and they bought into it just like you and I have. And they heard, and so after that, so now the beauty, they're about to discover that this beautiful thing that they had just had been experiencing of the interaction with God uh, is not there anymore because they had done the thing that they shouldn't have, so now entered sin, right? So, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. We we'll, can't read everything, so we'll skip over to verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So in between there, we would have had the conversation between God and Adam and Eve and the serpent. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And so here God is separating himself from uh, mankind, but it was still, this is an encounter with God. What went through Adam and Eve's mind in this encounter with God? See, here is no purity between them and God, right? Here, the connection between them and God is lost. This thing that God and Adam were doing and naming the animals, uh, it's inconsequential. Other than that, it is just shows the good open relationship, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Here now, that is gone. Here now, God met Adam and Eve, and what went through Adam and Eve's mind? Even when they heard God walking through the garden, what went through their mind is that, uh, woe is me, uh, we, we have sinned. That's what went through their mind. That is why they went to hide behind the bushes even before they even saw God. So God uh, send them out of the garden and he gave him a job to do. He said, uh, actually before he gave Adam a job too, he said, name the animals. So that's what Adam did. So Adam was uh, doing that. Now God gave them a job again. He said, I'm not, uh, yeah, to till the ground. Uh, it says in the, at the end of verse 23, till the ground from whence he was uh, taken. So and now I'm supposed to hoe around in the ground uh, from which I am made, which is what you and I are still doing. And so God gave people the job to do, uh, to work. And now we'd have to uh, work to earn a living, which is what we're still doing. And uh, so that was another encounter. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 34. And so we want to learn from just looking at these, at these uh, stories of people meeting God or of God meeting people, whichever way we, uh, we like to think about it. <clears throat> Exodus 34 and... Uh, We'll read uh, a few verses here, starting at the beginning. This is where now you've had uh, 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 people, the Hebrews, they were, God had met Abraham, we could talk about that. But, but So here are the Hebrews, God has redeemed them, he has met Moses in the desert, and uh, so now uh, here, here they are, uh, out of Egypt, they're in the desert, God has brought them to Mount Sinai, and uh, he has called Moses up to the mountain. And uh, so that's where we are now. Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hold thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. So uh, this is the second time that Moses was up in the mountain with God. He had broken the first stones. He had broken the law of God with the stones physically in that way. 
And now he was up with God again in the mountain, or God called him up there, and be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he owed two stables of stones like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And I wonder what's like. Nobody that I know of has ever experienced anything exactly like this. Here's Moses up in the Mount Sinai and God has come down from heaven in a cloud and God is in the cloud. Moses can't see God uh, because God is in the cloud, but right there is the cloud, and Moses is here. He's fizzy. He was alive like you and I are this morning, and Moses was standing there on the mountain, and there beside him was the cloud, and Moses knew in that cloud there is God, and in that cloud was God, and God was proclaiming the name of the Lord. In other words, God was, the way I take it, I don't know exactly what it was, but it sounds to me like God was telling Moses about himself. He was telling, letting Moses know who he was, who God is. So uh, that's what it says. Where were we here? Uh, verse 5, at the end it says, And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So here's God talking to Moses about himself. Isn't that? And this is what he says. Uh, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance and goodness and truth sound almost like what John the Apostle said about Jesus, right? What did he say? Full of grace and truth. Here God says to Moses, uh, gr merciful and gracious and abundance and goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and unto the third and to the fourth generation, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. So, uh, background theme, what is it like to worship God? And so I'm thinking that must be in the presence of God. That will be the highest worship. And so here is God in the cloud and Moses right next to the cloud. How close he was, I don't know. But anyway, there is God and God is proclaiming who he is. And Moses, when, uh, when he realized, uh, as he realized what is going on, Moses did something very, very fast. It even says it. Moses made haste. That means he hurried up. Moses made haste, and he bowed his head to the ground. He didn't go like this. He bowed his head to the ground. I, I take it he fell down flat on the earth, and he worshiped God. So there in the cloud, there's God. And he said, God, Moses said to God, if Now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord. Let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. So he's referring specifically to the worship of the golden calf. And, uh, well, let's read verse 10. And said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people, and I will do marvel, such as have not, this is God speaking again, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. A terrible thing doesn't mean the way you and I use terrible necessarily. A great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It is a terrible, it's a beyond comprehension what I'm going to do. And we see that is what God did as we look over history. Observe thou that, that which I command thee this day. Here's the command. Here's the work to do. And skip over to verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put a veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. When Moses went again to speak with God, he took the veil off so he could talk with God, but the people wanted him or he needed to put something over his face because his skin was shining. Why? Because he had been with God. He had been so close to God. That is kind of a side note. But uh, so there was Moses. And when Moses met God, he experienced God. And so Moses talked, God talked to Moses about his grace and his goodness and also about his wrath. And Moses real, uh, confessed his, his sin to God and God gave him a job to do. Let's look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> We have another account of somebody that met God in a very spectacular way, in a very close way, in a vision. We like, uh, yeah, this idea of a vision fascinates us. And here God, see when somebody has actually has a vision, it's not because they wanted to have a vision. If somebody actually has a vision ever, that is because God gave them the vision. Uh, so uh, never try to have a vision. If God wants you to have a vision, he will give you one. 
So here is Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, and so here's Isaiah, the prophet. He was a man like you and I are. And uh, he experienced something as he was in the temple. And he experienced a vision of God in a very real way. Isaiah 6 verse 1, we read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with twain. So each angel, whatever a seraphim is, I take it's a kind of angel. Each angel, each seraphim had six wings. With two, he covered his face. That's named first. So you're the angels. We think angels, well, they can be close to God, right? But these angels, the first, they had six set of wings to work with. The first set of wings they used to cover their face so they couldn't see God. That's the first thing they did. And with twain, he covered his feet. So the rest of his body, if you have wings, I don't know where they were. We always imagine on their back. So if you're covering your feet with your wings and, your, and the other two wings, your face, you're basically covered uh, from God. So these are angels, right? Not people. And with twain, he did fly. So the other two wings, he used yet to fly. So that's where we have the idea that angels can fly. And one cried, one angel cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the, not whole heaven, is, uh, that is too, but that's not what he said. He said the whole earth, so you and I want to see God's glory, go outside and look around. He said the whole earth is full of his glory. It means the presence of God, also the way it was in the temple. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, of the angel's voice, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, so here we're back to Isaiah, a man like you and me, woe is me, for I am undone. Isaiah saw this vision of God. He saw God there. He saw the glory of God. And then he saw how the angels were responding to God like that. And what was Isaiah's response? Uh, he said, it was better if I didn't see God either. He said, woe is me, for I am undone. Why? Think back to Moses. Think back to Adam and Eve. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He says, well, I've, I've seen God. I can't help it. I saw him. Now what do I do? I'm undone. I'm lost because I saw God. Just seeing God, seeing the holiness of God, he knows immediately though, then I'm lost because I had never realized this before. Now I know I'm undone. Isaiah may have thought of himself pretty good like we do, but when he saw God, he realized, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what he felt about himself. Maybe you and I would have something else, but that's how he felt. That's what he realized about himself. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. Obviously, the altar was used to sacrifice, right? So there's a symbolism there. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, so till now we have just Isaiah and the angels talking, but now God is talking. He's saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. So here's a pattern for us to notice. We're talking about what does it look like to meet God from the Bible. And so here's Isaiah, and he's seeing God the way he is in his glory. He's seeing the angels that are worshiping God, and he's realizing, you know what? Compared to that, I'm just undone. I have no chance. I'm undone. God purifies him, and he says, here's a job. I have a job to do. Who shall I send? And the purified Isaiah says, I will go. I will, go do the, I will go do the work. Let's, uh, we could look at more stories. I'm racing with the clock here. Um, let's look at Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> Over in the New Testament, we have the apostles that were with God together. There's something that we need to realize that when Jesus was walking on the earth, he was God. Jesus is God, the central truth of Christianity. A lot of people worship God, but not many people worship Jesus. Well, many people do, but compared, relatively few people. So when Jesus was on the earth, like the Apostle John said, the Word was made flesh, and He lived among us, and we saw His glory. And what was it like to see God? What was it like to live with God together? And He said, well, it's like it was full of grace and truth. That's what it was. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, and we'll read 
A couple of verses there. We start in verse 4. Jesus had been speaking to them. And uh, here's just one instance. And we could take many, many from stories from the disciples' life with Jesus. But let's take this one. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught of fish. That means, and Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled, worked hard all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had, thi- when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Can you imagine that? Happy fishermen. There was more business than they knew what to do with, right? Do you ever feel that way? It's just, man, here is God had blessed them, and they can't do it all. They look, come help us. And then they filled that ship too, and the ships felt like they were just going to sink right there because there were so many fish. When Simon Peter saw that, he was in one of the boats. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, what did he say to Jesus? Oh, there you are. Man, that's good to be with you today. Right? No. He said, go away, Jesus. You probably didn't know this, but I'm a sinful man. If you had known that, I don't know what was it, but this is what he says. Let's not read too much into it. This is what Simon Peter said. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes, what they had taken. And so was James and John and the sons of Zebedee, which were partners of Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, so what's, Jesus, what's God's response through Jesus to Simon? Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. You seeing a pattern? And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. To us, it's a story of the fishes, right? Oh, yeah, I would remember when they caught all the fish, right? It's good. These men's lives, it was a life-changing moment. They realized we are in the presence of God and we are sinful. What's going to happen to us now? And uh, Jesus said to them, he doesn't say much, he just says, don't be afraid. He had a plan. From now, go catch men. In other words, you will go preach the gospel. And when they had, they just rowed to shore, and they left their ships full of fish right there. It doesn't say anything else in that. They, yeah, it says they forsook all. They left their boats full of fish for which they had been so happy and excited. And they left them there, and then they followed Jesus with nothing except with what they were carrying. What does it look like to meet God? <clears throat> What is it like to meet God? Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 17. It's the account of where Jesus took three of his disciples onto a mountain. Again, they climbed a mountain like Moses had to do. Jesus knew already what he was going to do, but the disciples didn't know. Um, And Jesus knew he was going to show himself to his disciples in a way that they hadn't seen before. Yeah, they had seen him by the fish. Now they were going to see him in a different way. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Transfigured means changed into a different figure. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So this is what the disciples saw. Peter, James, and John. So they saw Jesus there shining like light and... uh, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. 
And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And if we keep on reading the story, they went down and they started working. We had that in Sunday school, actually, and there was a demon-possessed boy and so on. But their response to seeing Jesus and the hearing the voice of God in the cloud, similar to Moses, it produced intense worship, uncontrollable worship in them. They fell down on their face and they were sore afraid. God was completely Jesus was completely in control here. And then he said, arise, don't be afraid. All right, let's turn to Acts chapter 9. Here we have somebody that was a really good man. And he knew that he was a pretty good man. He was a decent man. He was a powerful man. He was a wealthy man. He was a very religious man. He was a God-fearing man. He was all that came from a good family and uh, a good association, good social standing, and uh, he was doing the Lord's work as hard as he could, as far as he understood. So Acts chapter 9, we know the story of Saul on the road to Damascus. So what does it look like to meet God? And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So here, and I know we've gone over this before, but Paul, Saul, The way I understand the story, Saul was doing God's work. In Saul's mind, Jesus was a false prophet. Jesus was a false teacher in Saul's mind. So he was doing a God service by persecuting Jesus, and since Jesus was uh, no, no more anywhere, persecuting those who held to him. That's what I understand, that's what Saul was doing. So in his mind, he was following after God, he was doing... Uh, God a service and so he was hating Jesus with a passion and there could have been selfish motives and more selfish motives involved as well that I don't know Uh, but that must have been part of it and desired he had gotten letters from the authorities and so on Uh, if he would find any of the way I'm reading from verse 2 paraphrasing whether men or women he might bring them bound to Jerusalem verse 3 as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven again it's not something that Paul had Saul had planned a light shone from heaven, and he fell to the earth. Does it sound familiar by now? He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? The confusion. I'm not. So, a couple of things. Paul knew, Saul knew right away that whatever is happening here is from God. It's way more powerful than what, what anything I can do. Way more powerful than humanity. This is God. But he's saying, I'm persecuting you, so I don't know how, he, he didn't have much time to think it through. But he says, who are you? That's what he asked. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Hasn't your life been hard so far? It's because you're kicking against something that won't be kicked. And he, trembling, and his daughter said, Lord. So in that first word, you can hear the complete turnaround in poor Saul's mind. Hating Jesus and persecuting Jesus and his people as hard as he could with everything he had. I hear he calls Jesus Lord, like just such a turnaround. All of a sudden he realized Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. What was his response? So what he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into this city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. There's that pattern again. Here's somebody who's meeting God, not at his own request, but at God's planning. God had a special work for Saul, and he says, Look, There he is riding on the road. Let's hit him. There he was. And Paul's life was turned completely upside down. Completely. I don't think we can imagine a more complete turnaround than what Saul had. He realized who Jesus was. And he said, what should I do? And God gave him a job. Later when he went to the city, remember, poor Ananias had to go and pray for Saul. 
And that would be another story of somebody that was doing God's will. Obviously, he must have met God in the past. So he was doing God's work, the work that God had for him. He went to pray over Saul, and God told him later that he was supposed to go and preach the gospel everywhere, including to kings and rulers and so on. And here Jesus just says to him, Arise, rise up again, go into the city, and there somebody will tell you what you're supposed to do. Undoneness, seeing God, realizing he was undone, falling down, worshiping, in other words, complete surrender, complete submission, and a job to do. What is it like to meet God? <clears throat> Let's look at one more in Revelation chapter 1. It's one of my favorite ones. Revelation chapter 1. The Apostle John that we read about before that had described Jesus as being full of grace and truth. This is the same Apostle John on the island. Remember, by this time, Jesus has died, risen, been in heaven for a long time. John, from what I understand, is an old man and uh, suffered heavy persecution, very, very heavy persecution personally. And so here he is uh, as a prisoner on the island of Patmos. And uh, this is what he experienced. Also, again, not at his calling, but at God's decision. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why he was there, because he had been testifying about Jesus and preaching the word of God. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, this is what, the voice said to John, he was, on the Lord, he was in the spirit praying in the Lord's day and then he heard behind him a voice. And this is what the voice said. Remember again, Moses, remember the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice speaking. Here John hears it. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and so on. So here is... Uh, uh, the job it comes in a different order. John had already met Jesus. Here's the work to do. Now, John, I'm going to show you some things. I'm going to tell you things. I want you to write them down and send out the letters to all the churches. I want everybody to know about this. And I, I John, turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment, down to the foot and gird about the paths of the girdle, girdle, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, and they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shineth in his strength. So here, like Isaiah, very similar, reminds us of Isaiah, saw Jesus in a very, very real way. Here's his response. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Does this sound familiar by now? Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And there is the work again to do. So John's response was the same way. Absolute worship, absolute abandonment to God. There is no other choice. There is no other choice. If you and I are going to meet God, that's the only choice we have. Complete loss of control to God. And so the Bible also says there, what about all the people then that don't recognize God? They say, oh, there, there is no God or don't believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says there will be a day where everyone will come to that point where they will bow down, whether they want to or not. That will happen. So uh, that is uh, another side note there. So here's, that's what John experienced. And he fell down like a dead man and God gave him instructions, work to do. And if we turn to Revelation 5, I would love to read the whole passage. Uh, we will not um, because of time, but you could read that. Revelation chapter 5, 
This describes what's going on in heaven, describes the worship in heaven around the throne of God. And uh, uh, verse 11 uh, says this, And I beheld, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. So this is John seeing now the things that Jesus wanted him to see. The beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands. I shared it with you the other day. Did anyone figure out already how much that was? And saying with a loud voice, this is what they were saying to God. All the angels and everybody around the throne, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all them that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four be said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So the final wonderful meeting with God. So where does that leave you and me? Uh, I am uh, someone that uh, I'm always, maybe I shouldn't be skeptical about uh, meetings with God and visions and all those kinds of things. Maybe I shouldn't be. But you and I, I do believe, like Pastor Ronald said before, that God is alive. God is a living God. God did not die. Jesus arose from the dead. Jesus is too, still to be experienced by you and me. He will choose how, he, how we experience us if our heart is turned toward him. If we want to experience him, he will allow himself to be found. He says that in too many places in the Bible that we can reject that. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens their heart to me, I will come in and I will sup with them and I will be their God and he shall be my son, something like that. Many other verses like that. They that seek me early will find me, God says. So we can seek God. And so I've said, well, it's at God's choice, but yet if we want to meet God, we can seek him and you can seek God and I can seek God and we can find God. And what does it look like to see God, to, to meet God, to meet God? Uh, we may think we are perfect people, but when we truly understand who God is, start, then we realize we're not. It takes Isaiah, it takes all these people and to realize, no, we're undone. Every single response is, as far as I, I can understand, a response of undoneness before God. When you and I think we're perfect, then we have something to learn and God will teach it to us. That is undoneness. It, it may in our eyes not be bad, but to God, it looks different than you and I do. And so it's undoneness. We have, that's one thing we will realize and we fall down and worship. And so and we will worship uh, means more than saying things. Worship is a complete sender, a surrender to God. And so um, you and I, we could turn to Hebrews for a few minutes. Uh, well, not for a few minutes. Just quickly turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We have a few uh, verses to read there. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12. It talks again. It refers to the meeting that Moses had with God. This is what it says, verse 18, verse in Hebrews 12. For ye, that he's talking to, to us now, you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which, they, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Like they wanted Moses to hide his face and so on, right? They beg, let's stop this. We can't stand this. They were not fit to meet with God, for they could not endure that which was commanded. If so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was his sight that Moses said, I exceeding fear and quake. So it's describing that whole experience there. But you, that's not what you and I are come to, but you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of men, of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So you and I, if we recognize our undoneness, if we recognize our sin, Jesus sprinkles us with his blood. Same thing as we've been reading about. And you and I can come to God and he sprinkles us with his blood. In other words, he makes us perfect. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, how much, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And so on. Let's read uh, um, 
Verse 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and a godly fear, for God is a consuming fire, uh, which you and I cannot move beyond. So we can give ourselves to God today if we want to and uh, a trust that we have. So let's think about that. What is it to meet with God? Let's pursue meeting God. And when you and I, how can we meet God? Well, one thing is what we're doing this morning. We're fellowshipping together, what we call it. We visit together, we share, we testify together. It's through preaching, through Sunday school. It's, but I think that is very important. But more importantly, through meditating on the word of God, to thinking about God, and also through Bible reading and to prayer. If you and I want to meet God, we need to be spending time, significant amounts of time in prayer. Yeah, one minute prayers are good, five minute prayers are good. Let's challenge ourselves to take time to meet God. God is a God of grace and truth. He will speak things to us that may, we may not like to hear about ourselves. We will start seeing ourselves, but after the truth, there is also grace. And he is, Jesus is a, God is a God of truth and of grace. And so let's take that opportunity that you and I have in this day of grace with God to spend that time alone and to meet with God. And you and I will walk away with a job to do. We will walk away purified if we worship God and we will also walk away with a job to do. So what is your job? What is it that God has for you today to do? We may not be uh, such spectac- experience such spectacular things as we have read this morning. Nevertheless, we can learn from that, and God is inviting us to come to him because he has, he has work that he would like to do, and you and I may be part of that. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can learn from that. Thank you how you reveal it to us. And I pray that each one of us, as we consider walking with you, as we consider what it means to be your child, to be your disciple, what it means to worship you, uh, help us to understand you correctly as well as we can. Thank you for your purifying blood. Help us to walk in that in godly fear like we read. And thank you for the work that you have for us. As we heard earlier, there's so much work to do, work that you want accomplished. And so God, help us to walk away from you or walk with you, rather, with that work and with the willingness and the joy to do that as your work, as your people, as those who are realizing that we are unworthy in ourselves, but worthy with you when you have touched us with your blood, with your coal of fire, When you have spoken to us, arise, be not afraid. I have a job for you, God. And so I pray that you would speak to each one of us in our own lives, wherever we are at, that we would do your work and that you would, as you have promised, when we seek you, you will let yourself be found. I pray if there is anyone here this morning who feels alienated from God, feels like, well, where is God? We claim your promise, God, this morning that If we will come to you, you will let yourself be found and we will walk away changed. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.